Uh, Dr. Trolley, we are so grateful that you're able to join us today. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to take a very quick moment to say thank you to our wonderful sponsors who help us make this happen. Uh, the Village at Waterman Lake, Encompass Health, uh, Re Rehabilitation Hospital of Braintree, and of course, uh, University of Rochester Medical Center. How are you today, Dr. Trolley? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. We are very, very grateful that you're able to join us, and hopefully we have a, a perhaps a special guest who will join us as well. Just wondering, can you tell our audience um, why you chose to specialize in movement disorders and particularly Parkinson's disease? Absolutely. So um, as Nancy mentioned, I am a neurologist, a movement disorder specialist, um, and most of the patients that I see are patients who have Parkinson's disease. Um, the reason I chose to specialize in this was, first, I, I really felt like it was a diagnosis and a patient population where I could make a difference. I think there's a lot that we can do for our patients, and uh, it, it really was rewarding for me to be seeing my patients over a long period of time. A lot of my patients, I've been in practice for a few years now, and I've already been seeing for four, five, six mm -hmm. years, and having that longitudinal care is really uh, rewarding for me and hopefully nice for them as well. Absolutely. That's great. Thank you so much. And um, I should mention that the U of R's uh, movement division, movement disorder division is a Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence as well. Um, I'm not sure we have made some plans to have a special guest uh, join us as well, someone who is very experienced as a person with Parkinson's in the telemedicine world. I'm not sure if she's been able to log on. We'll figure that out as we go. So in the meantime, uh, Dr. Trolley, as I mentioned, has just great information to share. So, uh, Dr. Trolley, whenever you're ready, you can get your screen, uh, your slides up on the screen, and we'll let you take it from there. All right. Can everybody see my slides? Does that look good? Looks good. Perfect. Okay. Well, so again, I just want to say thank you to Nancy for inviting me to be here today. Uh, and certainly to everyone who is joining us today. Um, just so you know, I have two screens here, so I apologize. This is a big telemedicine no-no to not look into the camera when I'm talking to my patients, but I am going to be looking off to the side, so just bear with me because you'll see that I'm doing that over the course of the talk if you are doing the side-by-side -side view. Again, welcome to everyone. I saw a few names that I recognized on that list and certainly a lot of names that I did not, uh, so I really appreciate you all being here. As Nancy mentioned, again, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Rochester, specialized in movement disorders. Um, and as part, of my, uh, as part of my work, I actually do a lot of work with telemedicine. Actually, over the past four or five years, I've been doing a lot of research as well as clinical care via telemedicine using both virtual visits as well as a lot of technology. And so hopefully today I can tell you a little bit more about that as this has really ramped up substantially, obviously, over the past few weeks. I think all of us who were excited about technology a couple of years ago thought that this was going to be something that we would see increase over the next few years. I don't think anybody expected to see an increase like this over just a period of a few weeks. And so hopefully some of the information I'm providing here can allow you to get the most that you can out of your telemedicine visit with your provider. So I'll just briefly talk a little bit about, just give an overview of what telemedicine is and a little bit of the history of telemedicine. I'll talk a little bit about um, trends in telemedicine, things that, you know, reasons that are driving us toward telemedicine beyond COVID-19, which is obviously a major driver of it right now, and then some issues that are still on the table that we need to address when we think about it. I'll talk a little bit about our efforts to date, um, so why I'm giving this talk and the experience that I've had and that we've had here at the University of Rochester. And then I'll talk a little bit about some practical considerations since I'm sure many of you are either scheduled for or thinking about having a virtual visit with your provider over the next few weeks and maybe you're feeling a little bit anxious about that. Hopefully I can uh, help with some of those anxieties. So let's just briefly talk about telemedicine itself. So what is telemedicine? Well, very simply, telemedicine is the remote 
provision of health care by any type of telecommunication device. And while most people, and what I'll be talking about mostly today, think about telemedicine being this virtual visit where we're trying to mimic the in-person encounter using real-time audio-visual technology, the reality is every time you call your doctor and you talk to them on the phone, you're technically using telemedicine. It's really any remote care. And telemedicine actually goes beyond this sort of traditional care as well. As we think about what the future of healthcare might look like, and again, this is where some of my research lies, we actually think about the use of some novel digital tools, things like smartphones, wearable sensors, home activity monitors, and how those can actually sort of broaden our understanding of patients with neurological diseases and certainly outside neurological diseases. Uh, those are also a part of telemedicine. But again, what I'm really going to be talking about today is this video-based visit that we're trying to use to mimic that in-person visit. So when we think about telemedicine, I think everyone thinks that this is such a novel concept. And while the reality is that the technology we use to do these types of visits is certainly novel, this is actually really hearkening back to what medical care was in the past. So in the 1800s, early 1900s, and certainly before that, house calls, physicians actually going to the patient's household, were really the standard of practice. Obviously, though, those decreased pretty substantially over the 19th century. So you can see here in 1930, somewhere around you know, 35 or 40 percent of all doctor's visits or doctor-patient interactions were the doctor going to the patient's home. That reduced to just about 10 percent by 1950 and was less than 1 percent by 1980. And the reason for those reductions are fairly self-explanatory. Obviously, technology was being developed. So we were developing things like x-rays, EKGs, labs, and those weren't things that were easily portable to the patient's home. Patients needed to come to us to actually uh, be able to take part or use some of those technologies. Additionally, inpatient care uh, really increased. We became actually able to treat a number of acute medical conditions, infections using antibiotics being a main one, but things like artificial ventilation certainly uh, a concern as well. And that's, again, obviously really only available if the patient is coming to us. There was also this this trend where we developed these medical subspecialties. So in the 1800s and 1900s, the reality is we didn't have a lot of treatments for conditions. And so because of that, you really didn't have to have a lot of subspecialized people out there. You were able to, one physician was able to provide care to all patients, no matter what their disease was. Well, that's not the case anymore. We are highly, highly subspecialized. And so the ability for multiple physicians being able to come out to the house is fairly unlikely, or at least it was until we developed the technology we have today. And then finally, transportation became actually much more ubiquitous. Patients became increasingly able to actually travel because patients had either personal uh, transportation methods or had some form of public transportation available to them. And so because of all of those things, the house call really declined. But as we've seen over the past few years, the reality is that virtual house calls, these house calls where the physician is actually coming to see you in your home via the computer, very similar to what I'm doing right now, have been rising in prominence. And this is just a, a you know, sort of estimate of what things have looked like in terms of virtual house call frequency over the past few years. And we were seeing this steady, steady rise. And then suddenly, we had a huge uh, shot up obviously in the setting of the COVID-19 pandemic, where we are trying to limit patients' uh, encounters in a healthcare setting because of the potential risk for them. All right, so what are, why are we thinking about telemedicine, and then what are the issues that really face telemedicine to date? Well, the major, major driver, and this is at least for me, I, I think there are other drivers elsewhere, but the major driver for me is the fact that telehealth, telemedicine is patient-centered. This increases access to healthcare. So there is a huge geographic mismatch between where providers are located, usually in urban centers, and where patients are located. I have plenty of patients that come from a very wide catchment area over 
most of the state of New York, plus some down to the southern tier, or some down into northern Pennsylvania, that some patients are traveling multiple hours to get here. And that becomes even worse when you get to areas of the country where there is even less dense population. Things like the upper Midwest and the West, so Montana, and then basically every state south of Montana has a very, very small number of providers for every patient that has Parkinson's disease or any other medical specialty. And because of this geographic mismatch, there is a huge, uh, there is a huge lack of care. It's, this is an average of across all specialties, about 20 days to secure a 20-minute appointment with a physician. I think most people, if anyone on this, uh, on this talk today has tried to get a new patient visit with a physician today, particularly with a neurologist, you would probably agree that this is a gross underestimate. I think for most neurologists, it's probably a waiting list of weeks, if not months. Now, telehealth will also or has the potential to reduce costs, and this is obviously a good thing for insurance companies, but this also trickles down theoretically to patients as well. It's estimated that virtual visits are going to cost somewhere around $50 per visit compared to about $200 for an in-person visit. And the reason for that is if I'm seeing you in an office, I don't need to have the brick and mortar location with all of the staff and overhead there. Now that obviously raises other concerns in terms of uh, things like jobs for people, but I think when we actually think about cost of care itself, this is obviously a substantial reduction. And then we're increasingly thinking about how can we make things more convenient, and obviously being able to do the visit in your home, particularly for patients with Parkinson's, who as the disease progresses may have increased difficulty with mobility, with balance, with transporting from one place to another, this becomes hugely convenient. Virtual visits really are doing a great job shifting the care paradigm. So this was a study done back in 2013 where they looked at the proportion of a visit that was spent with the physician. And so on the left here, this bigger circle is the in-person visit, and on the right here is the virtual visit. And what you can see is that in the in-person visit, patients spent more than three quarters of their total time traveling and waiting to see the physician, and less than a quarter of a visit was actually spent with the physician. This is completely flipped on its head in the virtual visit. Patients are spending about a quarter of their time actually getting oriented to the software, getting set up, getting connected, and then spending three quarters of their time with the physician. Now, for those of you who are good at math and did the numbers really quickly out there, you will actually notice that in the in-person visit, they're actually technically spending more time with the physician. So I, I did the math myself. This came out to about 55, 56 minutes with the physician here, only about 38 minutes with the physician here. But the reality is when they looked at this in this study, they found that patients who were being seen virtually actually perceived that they were seen for a longer period of time because their time was being spent so much more efficiently. Now, telehealth is not a panacea. There are barriers that we need to address here, and I don't think that this will ever completely replace in-person visits, but it certainly is a great supplement. But let's talk a little bit about what some of those barriers are. So these are actually slides that I created a couple years ago, um, and so this slide here, and we'll see on the next, is a little bit out of date, but up until about maybe March 15th, this was a major problem. Insurance companies were not reimbursing for telehealth services, and so because of that, patients were being left to cover these, uh, this care if they elected to undergo telemedicine. And you can imagine if insurance providers are not embracing this, this is not something that's going to be used on a more widespread basis. So these are just some stats, again, from earlier this year. So 29 states were requiring private insurance companies color, cover telehealth services. 48 Medicaid programs actually did, but the reality is that all of these programs were only reimbursing for patients who uh, lived in low provider availability areas. So me being in Rochester could not see another patient in Rochester because there are theoretically enough providers here for that patient to be seen in person. This obviously doesn't take into account the fact that it's nearly impossible for the patient to get out of their house. But again, this is actually, at least right now, not as much of an issue because there have been a number of federal and statewide executive orders that have actually allowed for reimbursement by the vast majority of insurance companies. And so currently, Medicare, 
New York State, and again, most other state Medicaid and most private insurance companies are now covering all telemedicine services. Now, it's not just coverage that's an issue with telemedicine. There are also clinical barriers, and I'll talk about these in a little bit, but obviously me seeing you via virtual visit is not exactly the same as me seeing you in person. For those with Parkinson's, you probably recognize one of the things we like to do as providers is move your arms and your legs in around. We're looking for what's called rigidity. I'm not able to do that if I'm seeing you remotely. And so there are some real clinical problems that we can't address via the virtual visit. There's also some legal questions around here about practicing across state lines and potential medical legal risk. I'm not going to get too much into that, though. And then there's also social barriers. Some of these, I'll be honest, I think are a bit overblown. So I think a lot of people feel like the virtual visit is going to feel cold. They're going to feel like they just can't be connected with their provider. I would push back pretty strongly against that, as we'll show you some of the data in a few slides. That's actually probably not the case. But there are some social barriers that are real and that we need to take into account. The major one being, keep in mind, in order to do a real-time audio-visual uh, conference, you need to have a, a, a specific amount of technology. And there are people in this country and elsewhere who don't have access to that. And the groups that are already at higher risk of poor health outcomes, those are the groups that are overrepresented who don't have access to that technology. And so the reality is telehealth actually does have the potential to worsen current, uh, current gaps in care. And so we need to be thinking about how we can address those as this becomes more broadly implemented moving forward. All right, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I just want to briefly mention, because you're probably all looking at me, those who don't know me at least, and thinking this guy looks like he's about 17. Why is he even talking to us? What experience does he have? So I can assure you we do have some experience with this to date. So I just want to briefly go over what we've done in Parkinson's to date. So this is a very busy table of studies that we've done using virtual visits in Parkinson's. And to be honest, I don't want you to focus on any of the words that are on this slide. I'll just have you focus on the number of patients that we've seen here. And if you do the math here, you can see that this is actually around 1,500 people who we've actually, who we've enrolled in either care programs or studies using virtual visits, using telemedicine. And this total is because we've seen many of these patients multiple times, this totals more than thousands of remote visits. So I just want to briefly go through a couple of these and what our experience has been with them to date. So uh, the, person, the person that I mainly work with here at the U of R is someone named Ray Dorsey. He really is someone who has put virtual visits for Parkinson's on the map. Um, and so a lot of the, the first two studies I'll show here are actually some of his really early work that actually got this out there. So this is really the first study. It was a, what we call a pilot study, just 20 patients at the University of Rochester and at Johns Hopkins. Uh, we, these patients, these 20 patients, were split up into two groups. 11 of them, so about half, uh, underwent usual care, in-person visits, and the other half, nine, uh, underwent telemedicine visits over about six months. And we looked at a number of different outcomes. But what you can see here is that patients were extremely satisfied with this. So this graph over on the right, the red and the orange means that patients are either very satisfied or satisfied. And you can see when we ask about things like convenience, comfort, ability to form a therapeutic relationship with the provider, more than 90% are indicating that they were either satisfied or very satisfied. And so that was a small study. So they essentially decided to do that again, but at about 10 times the scale. So now there were 200 patients, again, randomized to either receive uh, usual care, in-person care, or virtual care. And this was a much larger study. So this was a study done across most of the United States. Remember I said that geographic mismatch? Well, this is that area of the country where we have that geographic mismatch right here. But you can see that this was done at multiple centers across the United States. And very similarly, we found that, again, about 90 plus percent were satisfied or very satisfied with the connection, care, convenience, and comfort of the overall visit. But more important than these graphs, more important than seeing these numbers, I think is the actual qualitative data that we got from this study. Patients described convenience. 
not needing to travel six hours to and from their visit anymore, not needing to get a patient who had difficulty getting out of the house into a car, traveling a long distance, and spending a long period of time in an office. They actually felt that the quality of care was as good, if not better than the care they were receiving in person, equal or more extensive than the regular neurology appointment. And they felt like the, the questions that they were able to ask were more thorough and that they were able to, uh, they felt like they were having a better visit. And then again, getting at this idea of those, that interpersonal relationship, patients pretty uniformly said that they were able to form a good bond with their provider. They felt a remarkable feeling of closeness. They really appreciate that the excellent expertise of the provider, and they actually felt more relaxed because they were doing it in their home. And this was actually, this bottom one was a quote from a provider who really said that she was able to establish the patient-physician bond using telemedicine. So again, I think that idea, that social barrier, is probably one that's a little bit overblown. And then the last thing I'll just mention is something called PDCNY or Parkinson Disease Care New York. So this is a care program that we actually launched about two or three years ago. And again, if Anne, who's our patient representative, joins, this is actually where I've met her through. But this, uh, this program actually allowed us to provide free telemedicine care, free specialty neurological care to any patient with Parkinson's disease over New York State. And to date, we've seen more than 500 patients. Now, this program is actually ending, but I think actually as it's ending, that's probably okay because we've now really established that telemedicine is hopefully here to stay. All right, so now I just want to very briefly talk about some practical considerations, things that you should and can be doing in anticipation of a visit if you end up doing a telemedicine visit with your provider. So first, as I mentioned before, there is some necessary technology and equipment that you need to have. You need to have a high-speed internet connection. So obviously one of the things that we look for in Parkinson's is any evidence of things like slowness, and so many of you probably are familiar with the finger tapping technique. If you have poor quality internet, it becomes really challenging for me to tell if the slowness I'm seeing is internet-based bradykinesia or Parkinson's-based bradykinesia. And so having high-speed internet at home is really important. I'm guessing most of you on today or anybody who's watching this afterward probably do since you're able to access this, but again, you need to have that available to you. Obviously, if you're going to have a audio-visual conference, you need to have a device with video capabilities also. But that can really be anything. Most providers are going to use software that's compatible with laptops, desktop computers, iPads or other tablets, and, and smartphones. Um, and so you need to have one of those. And I would say, in general, you should try to use one that balances two things. So first, I think it's useful if the camera's mobile. I may ask you or your provider might ask you to move the camera or move your, ca your chair so that you're actually able to uh, be seen a little bit more during the visit. Um, and then the second thing that you want to balance is making sure you can see your provider well. So although a mobile phone is certainly quite, quite mobile, as, as its name implies, the screen is pretty small, and so that can become challenging. So for most patients, I generally say try to use a laptop, a tablet, or if you have a desktop with a, um, a, a webcam that's external that's not actually on the screen like you can see on this one, this would be an internal webcam, I would suggest using those devices as opposed to a desktop with an internal camera or a smartphone. And then finally, this is not for you to worry about, but providers do need to have software to actually conduct this visit. Um, it should be HIPAA compliant. There's been some relaxation of federal standards on this, but I would generally say as we think about privacy for these visits, you really do want your providers to be using HIPAA compliant software. The University of Rochester, just like the program we're on now, we use Zoom. We have a professional version of Zoom, so I know there's been a lot of bad press about Zoom out there recently. Um, the professional version that we have actually prevents a lot of those uh, security issues. All right, so what should then you do once your visit is scheduled to prepare for it? Well, the first thing is try to find a large private room, and again, to, opt to optimize your internet speed, try to be near your internet router if possible. You want to avoid backlighting. So although one of my favorite pastimes is commenting on the weather at your home, if this is what your video looks like, it makes it really challenging for me to assess what's happening with your Parkinson's. The exam becomes really difficult. You should try and have a hallway nearby. Again, we want to do as much of the exam as we can, and a lot of the exam in Parkinson's involves me just observing you from a distance, seeing what's happening with your body while you're walking or even while you're just sitting there. So having the ability to move the camera or walk a prolonged period is, is really useful. 
It can also be useful to have a family member nearby. This is obviously very important for anybody who has mobility problems, anybody who has maybe cognitive problems, people who have hearing impairment, can be really useful for those folks. But even folks without those things, having a family member nearby who can move the camera themselves and actually help with the technology can be really useful. And then obviously safety is something that we always think about here. And so if you do use any type of assistive device, have it available because we're probably going to ask you to walk and we want to make sure your walking assessment is as safe as possible. This is just a um, uh, kind of workflow that um, we included in a recent publication that, that I submitted. Um, and I'm not going to go through everything here. It just has some uh, general ideas for patients and physicians to do before their virtual visit. I will just mention, if possible, try to do this one. Try to test your camera and your audio before the visit if you can. You can download Zoom yourself, practice it with a family member. If you're going to be using your tablet or a smartphone, practice using FaceTime or some other uh, equivalent software on there just so that you have a general sense of how the video and audio are going to work. It will make the visit much, much more convenient and much less stressful for both you and your provider. All right, just a couple other practical considerations and then we'll look and see if, um, if Anne has joined. Um, so just want to mention a couple things here. So I mentioned a couple of the limitations. I'll just briefly go over those again. So obviously some portions of the exam can't be performed, though I would guess most of the people on this call or who are watching this afterward probably already have a diagnosis of Parkinson's or the, your loved one has a diagnosis of Parkinson's. And the reality is a lot of times in those patients, my care, the way that I'm changing medications or alternating care is going to be based on what you tell me, not necessarily on what I see on my exam. And so for most follow-up visits, telemedicine is actually a perfectly sufficient uh, supplement. Again, the ability to conduct the visit is also dependent on patients having access to the technology and their comfort with technology. There are certainly patients who just are not comfortable with this, and we need to realize that and think about ways that they can access care or that we still can make this available to them. Again, this is less of an issue now, but there is still some risk of financial liability. But again, the Center for Medicare Services, CMS, has agreed to pay for video and telephone-based telemedicine, and most private insurances have followed suit. I would, though, encourage anyone out there, before you do your first telemedicine visit with a provider, just reach out to your insurance company and make sure they are going to cover those services. And then finally, this is just getting a visit etiquette, and we'll end with this. Uh, just remember, your provider will generally want to see more than your face during the visit. And so just like you would in the in-person visit, I would encourage you probably not to come to your virtual visit without pants on. Wear clothes that you would feel comfortable them seeing. You don't want any surprises when they inevitably ask you to walk in your house. Um, and so with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen because that's all that I have. And we will check and see if Anne is here, who again is one of my patients. So I will just jump in here and ask as well. I've been checking. I did not see her log in, but let's okay. just give it another shot. Um, and as we're waiting, you know, I'm more than happy to answer any questions yep. that folks may have now. I'm guessing a few have come in at this point. We do have a few. So <clears throat> I don't think for whatever reason Anne is able to join us today, which is such a shame. But um, there's so much good information and so many good questions here, Dr. Trolley. So I'll start off with our first one. So how is the quote perception, and that's in uh, capital letters, of having more time with a doctor virtually as good as having more time with a doctor in person? I think this is from one of your earlier slides. Yes. Yeah, so I think this is referring to that slide with those two pie charts on it um, and thinking about you know, how time is spent and sort of, sort of time with the provider. So certainly, I, I think you can make an argument that, um, you know, actual time with the patient may be longer, or at least in that study was longer. Though I will say, again, looking at the data in that study, the patients who received virtual care perceived or felt like they were getting at least as high a quality of care 
as patients in the in-person visit. I think there is some efficiencies um, that come with this, and I don't exactly know where that time saving came from. Maybe it's that there aren't quite as many exam maneuvers that patients were able to do. Maybe there was something else about the visit that just ran more efficiently because Great. the patient was at home. I don't, I don't have an answer to that, but again, I think um, you know, the, the actual care metrics, the quality of care that were looked at in that study were also very similar between the two. So even though there was a smaller amount of time sent, spent with the patient, um, they, they, the quality of care was still as good. Perhaps with the explosion of telemedicine here post-COVID, perhaps we'll have even more data for folks to look at to help us understand. So the next question is, <clears throat> I don't have a care partner to help me with during a telemedicine visit. What should I do to best position myself? Yeah. So luckily, I came to my regular office today, which I've been spending most of my time at home. But, uh, you know, with kids running around in the background, it gets a little loud when I'm trying to give a 40-minute lecture. So I will say, um, I'll set my camera up. This is actually an external webcam. I'll set my camera up. I promise I am wearing pants. Uh, I'll set my camera up as uh, I would maybe think it would be good for you. So during the majority of the visit, during the history portion, having it just like this is fine. That allows me to observe things like facial expression, jaw movement, a little bit of arm tremor. Uh, but then when we actually get to the visit, setting up so that you're maybe about six or eight, have, being able to set up about six or eight feet from the um, from there, so somewhere like this, usually that is a, a pretty good distance that balances being able to um, see enough of things like tremor, but also being able to observe the entire body. Okay. So that that would I think again, it's really thinking about positioning is is important. And then actually, I got a um, a private message from somebody that I'll just answer in kind of response okay. to this. Sure. So someone had asked. Um, can you actually use multiple devices during a visit? And actually, with Zoom, at least, you can. So you can log in with, for example, your desktop computer and then with a smartphone or a tablet. If you feel like that other device, if you are fortunate enough to have multiple devices, if you feel like that other device is better able to uh, capture things by camera, you certainly can do that. I don't want anybody to feel like they need to do that, but if you feel like that would be useful, certainly you can. Okay. Take advantage when we can. Um, Dr. Torley, how do you envision telemedicine continuing post-COVID-19? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. I, I think undoubtedly telemedicine is here to stay, and it's here to stay much more rapidly than we anticipated. I definitely think, um, I don't think it's going to look like it is today. I don't think, you know, right now at least, except for emergent visits that I feel like absolutely need to be seen in person, all of my visits, new patient and follow-up, are being um, done via telemedicine. My, what I would see, at least for Parkinson's, is I think telemedicine will probably start to replace more follow-up visits moving forward. And for many patients with Parkinson's who are being seen maybe two or three times a year, I would anticipate at least my care practice would probably be something like alternating in-person versus remote visits. I do certainly think that it's going to increase. And certainly I would be, you know, I think patients themselves should advocate for what they'd like. If they feel more comfortable doing an in-person visit, they should let their provider know that. Or the opposite, if they don't want to come into the office because it's challenging for them, they should also advocate for that. So again, you have some, you know, at least some say in this, especially as we uh, move forward. Absolutely. <clears throat> so can you tell us about any care gaps that you've seen in your recent experience with telemedicine specific to people with Parkinson's? Yeah, so, you know, I will say, uh, I mentioned some of those populations that are at higher risk um, or, or have worse health outcomes at baseline or who already were not able to access care very well. There is no question that not just in Parkinson's, in every single medical condition, those gaps are being exacerbated today. I mean, there is absolutely no question in that. Um, in thinking about people with Parkinson's specifically and gaps in care, you know, I think in general, obviously, Parkinson's affects an older population. And again, in general, and this is not a rule, but in general, older populations are a little bit less comfortable with technology. Now, again, I will say I have plenty of patients who are in their 80s who are perfectly comfortable using their iPads to do a virtual visit with me. But there are also a, quite a large number that are not. 
Um, and so I think thinking about ways that we can address that, especially right now when this is really the only way that care is able to be provided, and because those people are probably the ones who are at most risk of, of being seen in person, at most risk of potential exposure, you know, we really need to think about how we can expand care to them. I think that will become less of an issue in five, ten years from now when the population who's comfortable with technology ages, I, I think that's going to become less of an issue. But that's certainly an area where I see a lot of uh, a, a persistent gap in care. Absolutely. Okay. Um, how about checking on DBS operation uh, for those patients who have had that procedure? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, for anyone who's on here with DBS, um, you all know you have a patient programmer. Um, so we are at least able to check the battery life. And depending on how advanced the programming is, we may be able to make some adjustments. I mean, you probably are would have to do that, you would have already had to have the ability to make adjustments. So we are able to do those things during the visit. At Current, currently, at least with all the technology that's out there now, we cannot remotely access anyone's device. I think that's probably a good thing for the long term. I don't think you want to have a device in your body that someone could remotely access from somewhere else. Um, so at, at present, to actually make adjustments beyond what's already been programmed, you do still need to come into the office. Um, but simple things like just checking the battery life or making simple changes that are already programmed in can certainly be done via telemedicine. Um, and I will say, again, we had actually held or stopped our DBS program uh, for, I guess it's been about two months now, and we are starting to slowly pick that up again. We're thinking about certainly we've been able to, if needed, replace batteries for patients. Um, but as, as time moves forward, we're probably going to start re-implanting systems in the next month or so. Excellent. That's very good to hear. Um, I want to make sure I, I'm not quite sure I'm totally understanding this question, but let me give it a shot. Um, did you measure the distance traveled to an appointment in relation to patient satisfaction? Hmm. I don't think that was specifically measured in that study, um, but I will say if you, if you remember that slide, I think it said the total um, travel time was something like close to three hours, um, so like an hour and a half each way on average for those patients. So obviously for some patients that can be a huge, huge uh, detriment, and I'm guessing that affects their overall perception of care, but again, I don't have data to back that up. Okay. Um, how about the Emerald study, Dr. Trolley? Um, can you discuss your findings? And I, I'm guessing perhaps the person who's asking might have participated in this, so I'm not sure, sure everyone knows what it is, but if you could give yep. us a little synopsis. No problem. So um, the Emerald device is, uh, so this was a study that we did with, uh, in association with MIT, so some very smart uh, engineers and computer scientists at MIT created this I don't know, picture size, it's like by 8 by 14 maybe, uh, device that hangs on your wall. It essentially emits um, ultrasound waves and kind of like sonar bounces off of things in the environment. And based on how it bounces off of things in the environment, it can give us information about what a person's activities are like at home. So it can tell us how fast they're walking, how much time they're spending in various portions of the house, uh, and various other things. Uh, so we've actually completed about three, well, we've completed two iterations of this, of using this device now. One, an initial pilot study of just seven patients. Uh, second, which was a little bit larger of about 30 patients. And then we have an ongoing study right now as part of what's called the Udall Center at the University of Rochester, which is looking at it in a much larger group, about 70 patients. Um, so what we found is that the device was able to detect changes in things like gait speed over a period of about two months, that it looked, um, was able to do that at least as well as our traditional in-person assessment, and that it was able to give us huge, huge insights into what a patient's life is like at home. So, you know, I can ask someone when they come into the office what their sleep is like, but actually having an objective objective graph showing me that they're only sleeping in some erratic pattern about two hours at random times throughout the day is really pretty impactful. 
Um, and so getting that objective data, while I don't think it will ever replace the patient experience and the patient report, can again, I think, be a nice supplement to care mm -hmm. that we're thinking about moving forward. So again, that gets back to that idea of telemedicine is not just video visits, it's also using these novel technologies. Sense. That makes so much sense. The more we can learn, the more we know, and hopefully invest in best care practices. Um, I wanted to let you know that we have a participant who's giving a plug for telemedicine. Uh, she states that she began participating in virtual visits over a year ago. She's found it very easy, cost, and time effective. And she's been very satisfied with the quality of the visits and highly recommends telemedicine. So that's great hearing for someone. And we love hearing from our community. So thank you for sharing that. Um, someone else. Great. And wrote? Deborah, could I actually ask just if I don't know if she wants to just type into the chat window, but um, I just wonder if her experience was, if she feels comfortable answering, if her experience was this was a visit with a provider that she had already established care with, or if she's seen that provider fully remotely over the entirety of, of her time. And again, I've done both. So again, as part of that Parkinson Disease Care New York program, that's where we, you know, um, that's where we saw patients newly diagnosed Parkinson's and I followed them over time. I've seen most of those patients I've never seen in person. So, um, so yes, yeah. so again, thank you so much for sharing. Um, someone else comments that um, I'm going to guess this might be Dr. Ruth Snyder, that she did a visit with Dr. Snyder and it went well using uh, a laptop and moving the laptop around the room. So that worked well for somebody. And our, next, yep. <clears throat> our next question, is there any research going on with respect to telechecks of DBS? It seems like this could be a successful, successfully engineered um, as some pacemakers, EEGs, et cetera, event recorders have been able to do this for some time. The cardiologists were using a corded phone nestled on a phone modem back in the 1980s. This would be uh, helpful. Yeah, yeah so, uh, so uh, I don't know of anything specifically looking at that right now. Again, I think, you know, Anytime you think about the broader use of technology, you do need to think about safety and privacy concerns. And so, again, if you create a device that you're able to access remotely, you need to realize that, again, I don't mean sound like a conspiracy theorist in any way, but there is a potential risk of that, of, of someone who is not your provider being able to access that. And so, you know, I, I while, I certainly see the benefits of it. I think, you know, I, this is certainly well beyond my knowledge and understanding of this technology. I think we need to really seriously consider what the security associated with that looks like. Yeah, sounds like a very serious consideration. Um, Dr. Trolley, are there any comorbidities, medical circumstances that would not benefit from telemedicine? I, so, I will say the, the general answer to that is no, with the caveat being, you know, I mentioned that um, telemedicine is perfectly sufficient for follow-up visits, right? Perfectly sufficient for that. Um, and actually, I'll take my no answer back because I think there are a few things that, that we need to think about. You need to think about the limitations of the visit when you think about this. So, you know, there are some neurological conditions where you really need to see the patient in person. You know, typical, really very classic Parkinson's, someone has a unilat one-sided rest tremor and they're a little slower on one side and that arm doesn't swing, I can make that diagnosis via telemedicine if I'm seeing them for the first time, no problem. But the reality is the vast majority of patients with Parkinson's don't fall into that category and being able to supplement with some of those in-person exam maneuvers is really useful for most new patients. Similarly, things like ALS and you know, multiple sclerosis, there are a lot, reflexes are really important in those diagnoses and you can't do those via telemedicine. And obviously this extends beyond telemedicine. You know, if I think someone has an ear infection, there's not really a way that my primary care doctor can look inside my ear to see if my, my eardrum is bulging. Um, and so, you know, you do need to kind of rely a little bit more on history and other things that you can find 
So there are some limitations to it, but I think in general, and especially right now, you know, I think, um, and maybe for the next few weeks, if not months, the, the risk of being seen in person is probably higher for most patients, particularly follow-up visits. Um, Dr. Trilley, just thinking about um, advocacy and on behalf of the person, um, it would be appropriate for someone uh, to ask, for example, like what, uh, can you tell me as a person or a patient here what your HIPAA compliance software is, just to kind of test the waters and know that the medical institution is following the proper law? Absolutely. And, you know, if anyone feels uncomfortable doing that with their provider, obviously most of the time your schedule, um, your your visit is going to be scheduled um, with with someone in of the office staff, and you're probably maybe a little bit more com comfortable talking with them, and they should have that information as well. So yes, definitely feel free to ask that. I think again, advocating for yourself is really important. Um, you mentioned social barriers earlier, and we certainly know that that is the case. Could you ever imagine? Um, in perhaps a more rural area where there might be a community center or a public library that provide privacy of a room and have the technology, could you ever imagine someone accessing telemedicine um, at that location versus in their home if they didn't have the technology? Yeah, so I think that is feasible. I think the main point being what you already made. You do want to make sure that's actually a private space so that you don't have anybody there that's interrupting you and that you can, you know, have your visit and feel comfortable with that. So yes, certainly can do that elsewhere. Um, but again, you just need to take those things into consideration. I will say actually what telemedicine was for actually the past quite a few number of years was rather than coming, you know, let's say I have a patient in Potsdam in very far, far Northern New York, um, we actually had a remote clinic there, and so they would actually go into the clinic and have their visit done there while I was in my office here in Rochester. So that actually can be done as well okay. um, if there's something locally set up near you. And just so you know, Nancy, I did just get a, an email from Anne, so she said she was going to try to join, so hopefully if she does, we can maybe, I don't know if we have maybe five minutes, I know we're getting short on time and we'll need to finish up here, so we'll see if she jumps on here. But just so you know, I did just see she uh, had some very, she had some technical difficulties. Oh dear, I'm so sorry, that's, ugh. Um, let's see, we, <clears throat> we can do another question. Um, my virtual visits were with an MDS, a movement disorder specialist, that I was established with. Um, this was this is the person responding to your question, Dr. Trolley. Um, I did not drive and transportation was a big issue. I requested the virtual visits. At the time, insurance did not cover it. I paid for it out of my own pocket. Three times the current cost. That's pretty Yeah, nice. so, and I think that, you know, even though virtual visits themselves are less expensive, obviously most people's visits are, are subsidized by their insurance right now. And so if you end up paying for a visit out of pocket right now, or at least up until about a month ago, that was a little bit more challenging. Um, so it does look like Anne may have joined us. Nancy, how much time do you think we have that we can run through? I just want to make sure we do the sort of highest yield questions here as best we can. I say, you know, take um, at least um, eight minutes. I'll do the wrap up very quickly, but we'd love to hear from Anne. Okay. Well, great. Um, Anne, I want to thank you for joining. Thank you so much. And hopefully we'll get uh, your audio will unmute when we need you to. Um, so I just want to, again, say thank you and sorry about any technical difficulties. Oh, um, I dropped my phone today. That was my problem. <laughs> I broke the screen. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, well, I was, uh, I was just hoping you would be able to just um, – I, I mentioned before that you were someone that I had seen via telemedicine, and so I was hoping that you'd just be willing to briefly introduce yourself to the group. Certainly. Um, my name is Ann Francis. I was diagnosed with Parkinson a little under, I think, five years ago. Um, I re am retired, was a human resources director at Harris Corporation in Rochester, and had planned on continuing to work for a while longer, but things got <laughs> changed a, a little unexpectedly there. Um, 
I've been um, working with Dr. Taroli in doing the telemedicine many times now, and you know, I found it a really, really positive experience. Great. Um, and so actually, could you just talk a little bit more about that experience? You know, what the telemedicine visit felt like for you and, um, and, and how, uh, you know, what your perception has been of it over the past few years that we've been seeing. Yeah, each other. It's been, you know, there's, there's been um, all different kinds of arrangements in terms of, of telemedicine. For example, my husband and I like to head down south for the winter and it's nice to know as we've done that you can just continue the conversations um, as if you were face to face from Florida or nice warm sunny places and, uh, and know that you've got continuation of care with the same person and you know, develop a little bit of history and, and know that you can be in touch with that person anytime, anywhere and that's really great. Great, yeah, I think that's a, a really good point. And um, again, the care program that I was seeing Anne through was this PDCNY, so that was not as, um, at least previously, uh, susceptible to the regulations of physicians needing to practice within state boundaries. Um, so I was in the past able to see her while she was elsewhere. Again, that has actually largely been lifted at this point. So over the past couple of weeks, again, the federal government has, and many states have lifted the regulations of needing to have a state medical license to see and care for patients um, elsewhere. And so actually that, again, for now the broad group of patients with Parkinson's is not an issue. Um, so you already talked a little bit about uh, things that you enjoyed or found really beneficial about virtual visits. And so I, I want you to be as honest as possible. You know, are there things that concern you about the visits or that you prefer an in-person visit for? Um, and I promise I will not be offended by anything you might bring up here. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm a big fan. I, I have a hard time coming up with any concerns. Now, before the first time, um, I remember thinking, am I going to be able to really be accurately evaluated from a distance? And when you think about what you normally do, at least what I normally do when I see my, my doctor in person, you know, a lot of the, um, the routine um, um, clinical checks that they do in terms of, you know, walking, uh, moving your, your hands a certain way and doing certain other things that they use to assess us each time, um, I thought, oh, is that, is that gonna really translate? And it was, it was something I shouldn't have worried about because <laughs> I would put my laptop on the floor and, and I could walk and, and uh, do whatever I needed to do so that um, the doctor could evaluate my walking. And, and um, you know, there's really very little that I think couldn't be translated into a, you know, a virtual assessment. Great. And you know, I think the last thing that I'm guessing this audience would find particularly useful from you, mm -hmm. um, I mentioned a couple things that people can be doing um, that in order to improve or um, you know, make their visit as successful as possible, things like visit setup, um, technology that they need. But I think hearing from you, what are the recommendations you might have for patients with Parkinson's disease or their loved ones? What should they know before their first virtual visit to make it as successful as possible for them? Oh, that's a really good question. I know what's important for me, and, and I, I can't speak to others, but that my husband could be present and um, could listen in. And, you know, I had agreed to that. And, and it was nice for him to have a, a easy way to ask questions or uh, run any concerns that he might have had by, uh, by the doctor. And so um, that was my concern before we began. Um, really, I, I'm sorry, I can't come up with anything else <laughs> that, you know, I've, I've had a wonderful experience and it was easy. The technology worked every time. And um, you know, I was a little intimidated at first thinking, oh, am I going to be able to hook this up? And it was easy. There was plenty of um, uh, reminders and instructions were clear um, so that, you know, I was able to easily set it up. I was a little concerned about that, but it worked every time. Great. Yeah, I think that actually you make a really important point. So one of the benefits we had in that care program 
was we actually had coordinators who were able to really walk patients through the orientation. Um, and so I think as best you can, if you're working with a provider who's doing telemedicine with you, see if their office staff has some ability to troubleshoot with you before your visit, because that can actually make you feel much more confident and, again, reduce a lot of the headaches that come along with the visit, you know, if you're troubleshooting when you actually go into it. So well, that's a, that's a great, great yeah, and coincidentally, completely, I got a phone call this morning from my regular um, doctor's office asking to set up a, a telemedicine check-in conference. And it was the coordinator who called and said that she would send me a link and would uh, call the day before to remind me. So I took the opportunity because she was um, doing this for, for a different doctor to ask her, you know, how in general is this being accepted by people? And are people struggling with the technology at all? And she said, remarkably easy for patients of all ages. And that, um, you know, for the vast majority of people, it's a you know, non-issue just to click a link and, and get in and, and have a conversation with their doctor this way. Great. Well, I think with that, I think that is a perfect way to finish. I just want to say thank you so much to Anne for joining us today. I think your insights, having experience with telemedicine, are probably the most useful part of uh, these past 40 minutes. So I do really appreciate you, you being on and giving those insights for folks. Um, and with that, I want to say thank you to everybody else for being here. And Nancy, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you so much. And while you're passing it back to me, Melody will take over and put up our other two important slides that we want to share with you. Um, and I'm so sorry about your phone, but I have to say I'm so, so happy that you were able to join <laughs> us. Um, thank, the voice, thank you. Sorry about that. Oh, no, no. This is this was wonderful. And uh, please know, I mean, the voice of the, our community is what is ultimately most important. So you being with us was just perfect. Thank you to both Dr. Trolley and Anne. And thanks to all of you who were able to join us today. Um, we hope that we'll see you again next Thursday. We have yet another wonderful expert, uh, Dr. Kathleen Staklosa, who is an occupational therapist. She's a professor at a local college and uh, LSVT certified. She works specifically and specializes in work with people with Parkinson's. And occupational therapy is something that I think we could promote in be much more useful for people with Parkinson's. Uh, but for a complete lineup of all of our virtual pro programs, because you can do any of them that you want from California to Columbus, Ohio, whatever you'd like, uh, please visit parkinson.org slash pdhealth. And um, one of the big announcements, uh, because of course the state of our world, <clears throat> all of our spring moving days, which really help to, to support so much of what we do, um, have gone virtual. So if you're interested, 1 p.m. this Saturday, uh, movingdaywalk.org is where you can participate. And there's a great uh, lineup of speakers and exercises. We hope you can join us for that. And then last, lastly, um, our Care Partner Summit has also gone virtual. So for all care partners, caregivers, please check it out. It will be a wonderful program that will be in about two weeks. And as always, let me just give a plug for our helpline. We have fantastic specialists who answer our helpline, 1-800-4PD-INFO. You can call the helpline to get information, any of our books, the newly diagnosed kits, um, and certainly answer your, any of your questions. And I know Danielle has been populating those in the chat box. So once again, my thanks to everyone. Um, who has joined us today and we thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you again for more um, Take Time Thursdays and in general for our PD Health at Home program. Thanks so much everyone.